It all started with a streak of light in the sky that was seen all over the world. A series of anomalies from outer space unfolded one after the other, and nobody had any idea what was going on. This searing beam was coming from a cosmic body several light years away, and there was more to it than what people had imagined. With the Event Horizon Telescope, they learned that the streak of light was a plasma jet from a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, labeled as Sagittarius A. The giant black hole that was 4 million times bigger than the Sun suddenly went very active and the accretion disk which made it visible were torching in different directions, like layers of whirlwinds clumping together. The torsion of light, gas, and dust that surrounded the black hole were whirling unpredictably fast as the black hole's rotation became very unnatural. The immeasurable speed made it quite hard to capture a still image, and the manner in which the things were coiling around it was nothing like they had ever seen. Sagittarius A became more visible than ever before as it was enveloped by the matters swirling around it. But not even the experts of the field could explain what was actually happening. Like a single ball that was rotating forwards and backwards, left and right, it seemed that the black hole was spinning in different directions all at once. It was simply impossible to occur. And yet, it was happening. This mysterious anomaly made the experts question their studies about this cosmic body. But before they could even begin to formulate a theory, another inexplicable event was already unfolding. Aside from the streak of light in the sky, several people in different parts of the world had claimed that they were receiving a strange radio feed. Space agencies stated that it was some kind of radio transient or signals of an astrophysical event. But common household radios should not have been able to pick up this kind of cosmic phenomenon. It became a hot topic of discussion as more people were finding the frequency to hear the mysterious noise themselves. These unexplained events were bound to garner far-fetched stories and conspiracy theories. Some folks were blaming the plasma jet for the rising heat and their dying crops, while the superstitious ones were saying that it was some kind of omen. At that point, NASA and the other related agencies under the government had chosen to remain quiet about these matters for some reason. With their silence, the people tried to come with their own answers. The public discussions about the mysterious event went further. They believed that they were all connected. They became a common topic within supernatural enthusiasts and people of faith. The religious folks started using the beam of light to promote their beliefs as if it was a sign from their god. On the other hand, conspiracy theorists were claiming that the erratic behavior of the black hole and the jet were signs of alien activity. Coincidentally, there were also a few other incidents that supported this idea. Ever since the beam of light appeared, several reports from individuals of different communities claimed that they saw an extraterrestrial being. Some described what they saw as human-shaped silhouettes made of light, while others said that they saw iridescent orbs descending from the sky. Along with these reports were six new crop circles that appeared in different parts of the world. Unlike the previous ones, these formations looked very different and had distinct figures in them. Previous crop circles were geometrically sound compositions of continuous lines with perfectly equal arcs and corners. But the six new circles had unique figures at the center that looked more like runic characters. Furthermore, the time when these formations were reported suggested that they all appeared simultaneously without anybody noticing them. These roughly 15 feet patterns were shaved on fields and etched on rocks in different parts of the world and simply just appeared. But regardless of these strangely similar reports, People did not believe their claims due to the lack of evident proof. Many crop circles were proven fake, and spotting some orbs was also new. The humanoid made of light sounded like it was just a person shown by strong headlights. Meanwhile, the discourse about the radio noise had also grown exponentially. 
several individuals were sharing their thoughts and data in forums. They believed that the signal was coming from the streak of light in the sky, and they thought that there might be something more to it than just the feedback of a cosmic event. Some information was more convincing than the others, and their data became a starting ground to further their observations. The unidentified signal was a sequence of clicks, pulses, and pauses, which seemed quite random at first. However, dedicated individuals listened closely and recorded it from the beginning of its transmission. They discovered that there was a pattern in it, and it was running in a loop. At least a dozen people made their own observations, and all the results were the same. They claimed that they listened to the transmission for days, and they learned that it would take roughly 26 hours to complete the sequence, until it would repeat again. They showed the graphs of the signals in print, and it appeared that they were telling the truth. With this discovery, it was quite evident that the noise was encoded, rather than being a mere feat of a natural event. Wherever the signal was coming from, and whoever was sending it, the noise was transmitting an encrypted message. More capable individuals got involved in the discussion, and they started to uncover the contents of the feat. It took quite a while before anyone could make sense what the sequences meant, and when somebody was finally able to decode some parts of it, what he found about the mysterious noise just led to even more questions. Using various methods, he discovered that the encrypted transmission contained some kind of measurements, a thorough list of size dimensions, mass measurements, placements, and equations. It was a dictation of parts, or rather, their shapes and sizes, carefully detailed with their every length, height, order, thickness, and curves. Apparently, the message was not in sentences, but some kind of a blueprint. Along with the list, the message also mentioned some coordinates. Oddly enough, the specified locations were the places where the new crop circles had appeared. This unofficial discovery had caught the attention of the media, and more people began to believe what they initially thought was just another conspiracy. The first question that caught their attention was, who was sending the message? People started wondering if there might actually be something out there. But there were also others who still refused to believe it. If it was true, the noise in the radio was an attempt of first contact. Furthermore, the message was basically a thorough information about a long list of parts. Some individuals followed the measurements and made visual depictions through various digital software, while a few went ahead and made physical models. There were hundreds of parts and a thousand measurements decoded from the message. Even though the provided details were quite substantial, there was still a lot of room for errors, since they assumed that it was an assembly blueprint. They used existing parts of machines they were familiar with as references, and made their own adjustments. As a result, they gradually deviated from the instructions in order to fit their own ideas of what the parts were for. Even if they still had no clue what the blueprints actually was describing, some had tried to dedicate a lot of time and effort to materialize at least half of the things on the list to have a better idea of what it was. And there were a few individuals who were able to put some of the parts together. One man in particular named Devon Cohen was able to assemble what looked like a quarter of a spherical container using the parts that he printed. Unlike what the others did, the only thing that he changed was the general scale of the figures in order to miniaturize the contraption. The pieces he materialized from the list looked more like parts of an elaborate puzzle rather than a functional machine of any kind. And so, he treated it as such, until it finally took shape. When he shared the progress that he made, the others followed his method and tried to complete the shape of the sphere. However, none of them was able to succeed. Devon stated that he took this approach when he was reminded of a puzzle ball that had some similarities to the pieces from the list. And he also knew why nobody was able to complete the shape of the sphere, no matter how many parts they forced into it. The puzzle ball also had the same quirk. Since it was a puzzle, many parts of it was meant to move from one position to the other without breaking it apart. 
Devin realized that the surface of the sphere would also have a lot of gaps where the moving parts could pass through. The others couldn't complete the shape of the sphere because it was not intended to be completely sealed. I also had the same idea when I saw Devon's miniature model, since the person who designed the puzzle ball that he mentioned was me. And it was then when I decided to get involved. We met up and worked together to finish the sphere, but the capacity of our combined knowledge was only good for assembling the outer shell of whatever this contraption might be. After roughly two months, we managed to complete approximately 50% of the sphere. Devin's printed model was only about 2 meters tall, but the actual size of this thing would be comparable to a small house according to the blueprint. I did not interact with the others in the forums, but Devin consistently shared our progress to the group in hopes that we would find another help. As we were still figuring out the parts of the puzzle sphere, another inexplicable event unfolded. In different parts of the world, spectral images appeared out of nowhere for everyone to see. In the middle of cities, across the oceans, on the mountains and deserts, 20 feet tall motionless humanoid creatures that seemed to be made of nothing but light just suddenly emerged. They were like silhouettes made of smoke, and there were no other features distinguishable aside from the shape. People were quite baffled, but it seemed that they did not pose any threat. They were nothing but ghost statues or lifeless projections, but nobody could explain how they came into sight or where they came from. There was only one thing in everybody's mind at the time. It was not of Earth. The spectral giants had one of their arms raised, and they were all pointing towards the sky. First was the beam of light, and then the mysterious radio transmission just when we figured out the contents of the transmission, giant projections appeared. At this point, only the fools would not see that these events were beyond what we could explain. Research facilities were made around the spectral statues to study them, but their efforts were futile. The religious folks erected altars to them and claimed that they were angelic figures that were sent as a sign. Their belief might sound ridiculous to others, but they weren't entirely wrong. A few days after they appeared, we learned that these giants of light were projected on Earth to warn us of what was about to come. Devon and I continued to assemble the sphere while the rest of the world was busy with the spectral statues. While we were working, a black van stopped in front of his apartment and a couple of men in black suits knocked on his door. We were reluctant to let them in for obvious reasons until they said that they were sent by the government and showed their IDs. They read out their files that had our details, including the names of our family relatives, previous and current addresses, emails, and work histories. By the sound of it, the files had more information than they told us. They stated that they simply wanted to make sure that they found the right people. But such a thorough background search just to identify us was quite excessive, to say the least. They said that they came to see the sphere model that we were working on, and they were surprised by our progress. They discussed among themselves before they decided to tell us what we needed to know, and I was in complete disbelief by what I heard. The men in black suits were from a secret agency that was working closely with NASA ever since the beam of light appeared. They were able to decrypt the radio transmission early on and already started building the machine. However, they were having some troubles assembling the exterior, which was exactly what Devon and I were trying to build. They have been watching the forum discussions closely in order to replicate what we were doing. Unfortunately, they no longer had enough time to wait. An insurmountable adversity was coming closer to Earth in each passing day, and humankind's only chance for survival was the machine. They showed us the three sets of images of space taken from the last five years. The first batch of images was from five years ago, and the second batch was taken two years later. I didn't realize it at first, as I was looking at them. The only thing I noticed was, there were fewer stars in the second batch of photos. They told us that they were all photos of the same spot. And then, 
I looked at the third set that was taken last year. In the latest photos, the number of the visible stars were significantly reduced. It was then that I understood what they were trying to say. The stars were disappearing. The experts of the field could not explain what was happening, but it appeared as if the stars and everything else were being swallowed by darkness, and it was getting closer and closer to us. Based on their calculations, this enveloping void would reach the Earth in approximately four years after it reached Proxima Centauri. They told us that their agency was already aware that there was other life in space that people did not know. They detected a signal of a moving craft several years ago, and that was one of the reasons why they kept on blasting off radio waves in an attempt to find them. The fact that these beings reached out to us themselves was also a confirmation of how dire our situation was. The agency believed that they were trying to aid us. The jet from the erratic black hole acted as a bridge to extend the reach of their communication. As a result, every active radio was able to receive the transmission. Aside from the fact that this imminent threat was a concern to everybody on Earth, there was also another reason why the message was sent to all. It seemed that the ideal plan was to create several machines that should be enough for the entire race. Unfortunately, we could only make one. We asked them what the machine does and how it would save us. But since the case was highly confidential, we had to agree with their terms before they gave us the answers. We had no reason to refuse their offer. Everything was at stake and we were willing to help as much as we could. They made the right call to not reveal the problem to the public. It was already bad as it was, and I could imagine how worse it could get once they realized that the world itself was in danger. We did not waste any time and traveled on the same day. We immediately flew to Nevada, where a station was made for the construction of the machine. After signing an NDA, they finally told us the rest of the details. When the streak of light appeared, several unusual meteorites entered our atmosphere and crashed in different parts of the world. Each of them contained a very rare crystalline stone. On its own, these stones were relatively harmless, but when used as a catalyst, it could output an unimaginable amount of power that would be more than enough to pulverize the continents. One of the main reasons why the project was made highly confidential was because they initially thought it was a weapon. But as they followed the blueprint, they realized that the stone was a source of power to activate the machine. Unfortunately, these stones were very fragile and only a single fragment of it was able to survive the crash. They were hoping that it would be enough, but the machine had to be built first in order to find out. The purpose of the sphere was to contain the surging power of the activated stone. They believed the machine might open some kind of portal but it was just a theory without anything to base upon. Since this kind of technology was beyond us, all that we could do was follow the instructions and hope for the best. The symbols on the crop circles that were mentioned on the message were a destination code. If done correctly, the other side of the portal should lead us to a specific waypoint. Whoever sent the message, they chose this location for us for a reason. The crew inside the station were highly regarded experts of their fields. Compared to the prolific scientists and engineers, I wouldn't have imagined that a mere puzzle maker like me would be given such an important role. Devon and I were able to assemble approximately 62% of the sphere up to that point, but it took us roughly 5 months to do so. There were times when we couldn't even fit a single piece for a week. Once the closest star to the sun disappears, we would only have a year left to figure out the rest while using the puzzle pieces in their actual size. If we fail, the void would swallow the earth along with everything. I couldn't even begin to understand the inner workings of the machine. Aside from dozens of armatures with curved grooves, there were so many small parts that were set to move like peculiar cocks that would trigger a rapid continuous motion. At the very center was a slot to place the stone and it was surrounded by gyrating rings. Below the slot was a dial where symbols from the crop circles had to be indicated in correct order. One mistake might cause us light years of difference. 
the moving parts of the sphere were attached to the interior pieces, as if they were meant to guide their movements. Each piece of the puzzle was made of titanium, and they had to be slid in instead of forcing them to fit. Every piece had to be precisely how it was described on the list. It had to run perfectly on the very first attempt. There was no room for mistakes. Two years later, we managed to assemble 85% of the sphere after multiple trial and error. We were running out of time, and we couldn't afford to sleep. We were so busy in the station that we didn't know what was happening outside until I received a call from my grandmother one night. She asked me to look at the sky. I stepped out to check what it was all about, and I almost dropped my phone when I looked up. Even though I was already aware of what was about to happen, the gravity of the situation was much harder to bear when I saw it with my own eyes. Aside from the absence of the stars, the sky was as dark as black ink. The void was moving much faster than we thought. Proxima Centauri, the star nearest to the Earth after the Sun, was approximately 4.2 light years away. If it disappeared, they assumed that we would have enough time to complete the machine. Proxima Centauri just disappeared two years ago. Unfortunately, the void was moving faster than the speed of light. If not for the moon, the sky would already be nothing but complete darkness. Fortunately, the spectral giants remained. Aside from being a source of light, they became a symbol of hope. Whatever and wherever they may be, they were waiting for us. With the help that they provided us, they believed that we could make it in time. On the other hand, some of the crew at the station were starting to lose hope. Eventually, a few had decided to leave. One of the engineers, Gareth Keynes, hadn't seen his wife and daughter for three years. Due to the confidentiality of the project, he couldn't tell them the importance of his role. But no matter how much he wanted to go back home, he decided to stay with us in hopes that we could save them. The leaders and high officials from different countries visited the site. After realizing that the void was approaching much sooner, they wanted to see the machine. They made the arrangement to ensure that their families and acquaintances would be the first ones in line once the portal was open. Some of them offered us hefty rewards if we could complete the sphere much faster. But all the things that they could give us mean nothing if the world was to end. Some try to use intimidation, especially to me and Devin. During these troubling times, people reveal their true colors no matter how noble or dignified they claim to be. In the end, everyone would put their own interest before others. We were already doing the best we could, and no reward or fear would help us in any way at this point. After seven months, the 10 meter high spherical machine composed of roughly 3,000 moving parts was finally complete. Gareth and the other crew connected the moving pieces to the interior machine. We checked, rechecked, and we checked again. We did everything we could. Even though we did our part, I was far from satisfied. We have yet to know if the machine would actually work. At that moment, there was only one highly valued item for the entire human race. The key for this machine to work was the fragment of a fragile stone. If it breaks during the process, there was nothing else we could do. The machine was transported to an open space that could accommodate thousands of people. All of us were holding our breaths as the stone was placed in the heart of the machine. The destination code was dialed, and the operator stepped away. The spherical shell had a spacious gap that was big enough for a person to comfortably walk through. According to the message, the final step was to pull down the sliding piece of the sphere like a lever to close it. After a few seconds, Devon and I looked at each other. We were both wondering if we failed. But then, we felt a vibration from the ground gradually growing stronger and stronger, like a ripple on the surface of water. The vibration from the machines was traveling across the ground in the form of waves. The waves turned to pulsating nudges that went faster and faster. It suddenly let out a sharp, penetrating noise that was almost too high for our ears to hear. Light suddenly leaked from the gaps of the sphere. And then, it emanated a flash of blinding light. 
there was a single strong jolt, and then it went silent. When the light dimmed down, we were surprised when we saw the machine steadily afloat a couple feet above the ground. The sphere began to shift its parts on its own as it revolved in place, and the rotation kept on getting faster and faster, until it was too quick to see clearly. It was spinning so quickly that it seemed to bend the elements around it. The space itself started to distort, and then the machine just vanished in thin air. Right on the spot where the machine was floating, a gateway to a different world appeared. The high officials came early to see if the machine would work, and they were completely dumbfounded when it actually did. Right before our very eyes was a portal to another world. A small group of soldiers crossed over to see what was on the other side. After an hour, they returned with a branch of a tree. Aside from the breathable air, they confirmed that the world on the other side was safe and habitable. The human species would be spared from the void, and I finally felt at ease. Armored vehicles and military men were posted on every side of the field to cart the machine. On the following day, people were finally made aware of the situation, and a complete migration was declared by the leaders of the countries. They began to make some arrangements to transport their citizens. They were gathered by category, from those with essential roles in society and down to the retired elders. There are approximately 8 billion people on earth, and different nations would come from every corner of the earth. It would take quite a while before at least half of the population could cross over to the other side. Little by little, communities began to shave off their numbers in their own ways. The others, or the aliens, whatever they were, wouldn't force those who didn't want to come. Despite everything that was happening, there were still some people who refused to believe in them. Aside from the hard-headed fools, there were also those who chose to embrace their fate and die with the only world they knew. There were also countries who excluded citizens with two or more criminal offenses. I went back to my grandmother's home, and I already accepted what was about to happen at that point. My grandmother was the only family I had left, and she was grouped with the last batch to transport because of her age. Those who worked with the machine were promised an early shot for them and their families. But I knew that my grandmother would refuse to leave her beloved home. And I would not leave her alone. While the world was in chaos, my grandmother was making porridge for me. When she called me when I was back at the station, I broke the NDA and told her why I was there. I told her that I would come to pick her up. But she told me to come for dinner instead. She wanted me to save myself, but she also knew that I wouldn't listen. Unfortunately, the stone that powered the machine eventually shattered to pieces. Only a tenth of the world population was able to make it to the other side. Rather than a missed opportunity of a new life in a new world, what I would regret the most was to not be on my grandmother's side during the last days. As the sun was shrouded in darkness, we sat on the porch, waiting for the end. With a smile on our faces, 